Okay, good morning, Austin. Um, we are in Austin, aren't we? I didn't hear much back there. Good morning, Austin. Thank you, people. Um, all right, so let me start. I'm going to move to the front of the stage just because I can't... Oh, that's better. I can see. So I wanted to start by asking for a show of hands. Who here considers themselves a millennial? Okay. All right, well, we have some very young-looking boomers then. I think there might be some boomers out here lying about their age. Um, okay, and who among the millennials has had friction in their workplace with people of another generation, obviously a generation above them. Okay. All right, so a show of hands. Who here considers themselves Gen Xers or boomers? Okay, well, and boomers, who I have among the head. Gen Xers and boomers has had friction in the workplace with millennials? Okay, all right. So what I hope you leave this panel with today uh, are some practical tools, if you like, from the conversation I hope we're about to have in terms of how do we all work together? How does this generation of sort of brilliant uh, millennials fit in with the rest of us? How do we all work happily together? How do those of us who weren't brought up digital natives or born born digital. How do we work with those who were born digital? And where do we meet for the, for the good of all of us? So I'm thrilled to be joined with today um, two fantastically articulate uh, men who have great interesting points of view on this subject and who are really living this discussion. And on my right, I'm sure familiar to many of you, is Pete Cashmore from Mashable. He started Mashable. He's the ultimate millennial. He started the business in his bedroom, in his parents' home in Aberdeen. And I don't know what else he was doing in his bedroom at his parents' home in Aberdeen, but I think Mashable was by far the best product to come out of it. And um, <laughs> on my left, I have equally genius, somewhat older, if I may say that, um, Olivier Fleurot, uh, as nice a name, who's currently the CEO of the MSL Group. And I'm going to ask them both to kick off by telling us all a little bit about how they started, the point that they're at now, and then we'll pick up the conversation about millennials. And for those of you who don't know me, my name's Joanna Coles, and I'm the editor of Cosmopolitan. You may detect I'm not a natural New Yorker, which is where Cosmo is actually based. I grew up in Britain, uh, actually not that far from Pete, a couple of hundred miles uh, further south. And I was a journalist for a long time for The Guardian and for the BBC. Then I moved to New York for The Guardian and then got into magazines. And I love editing Cosmo. It's enormous fun. And it's a huge global brand. We have 64 international editions. So, Pete, start with you. Tell us a little bit about how you started Mashable and where you are with it now. Sure. And I did actually uh, want to thank everyone for coming up. We're on at the same time as Nick Cage right now. So everyone in the audience has major FOMO going on. They got like <laughs> Instagrams, everyone, their friends hanging with Nick Cage and, you know, but thanks for coming to see us. Um, so uh, I started uh, at 19, yeah, I was living in Scotland and um, started essentially a blog and um, it took off and it, you know, it moved out to San Francisco for a couple of years, now I've been in New York a couple of years, and um, you know, very much targeting you know, this millennial audience, trying to figure out how do you make sense of this internet revolution that's happening right now? Uh, how is it gonna change everything from you know, business to entertainment to uh, politics to just the way we communicate? So really, you know, we've added over the years a number of channels. We're now expanding out into entertainment. It's a very big one for us, so we've just uh, about to open up uh, an LA office and you know really covering that scene and how that's being revolutionized by uh, technology just as you know we've covered business and we've covered actually pure technology as well. And is your staff mainly made up of millennials? Um, yes, I'd say the majority are millennials. Uh, most of our people are based in New York and um, yeah we're probably about you know 70 70% 70 millennials I'd imagine. 
Okay. All right, Olivier. Give us, you, you, Olivier's had five different careers, so I want to reassure the millennials out there, it is possible cool. to have five different careers, look as good and be as rich as Olivier. <laughs> um, you don't have to run through all of them, uh, but give us a sense of the variety, because I know there's been a variety. Okay, thank you. Well, I started as an engineer. Technology at that time was very different from the tech we are discussing now. I then wanted to be a journalist and became a journalist uh, in France. Uh, then I was covering the high tech, the first wave of uh, computers, and I decided to join a startup uh, that was uh, developing software for the Macintosh, the first Macintosh, the box. Wow. Yes. That really dates you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Joanna. Yeah, <laughs> I knew. It does. Um, and then uh, I went back to uh, media, managed um, a French uh, business newspaper, then was given a fantastic opportunity to work in your country and manage the Financial Times there. I was a cultural exception. And then I went to advertising, and now I run a uh, communication and a strategic communication agency that employs probably uh, over 3,200 people really around the world and we have about 40% of millennials um, in our staff and about 40% uh, of uh, Gen X. So it's an interesting mix and um, it uh, requires quite a lot of work to uh, make all these people work and a few baby boomers. Uh, to uh, make all these people work uh, in a very multicultural world. So I don't know how many of you here, well actually let's ask, how many of you are here, here are on LinkedIn? Okay, good, that's interesting, so everybody's here on LinkedIn. So um, Olivier wrote a very interesting piece on LinkedIn last year about uh, about the tech generation really in the, work in the workplace and about the friction that some of um, uh, some of the ideas that, that um, Gen Y have and this sort of sense of voice that being born digital um, gives you. Uh, and I would like you to talk a little bit about that piece and I recommend you all read it because it's a really wise, interesting piece that raises all sorts of questions about how we interconnect in the office. But why don't you sum up for people what you were, what you were saying and let's talk about some of the conflicts in the workplace that, that would be interesting to get your take on too? Well, um, okay, One, first point, millennials tend to uh, be quite ambitious and uh, they want management roles quite early in their career, much earlier than uh, uh, my generation uh, did. So for us, it's the first point, we need to give them new opportunities and new challenges on a much uh, more frequent uh, uh, basis than before. Um, it doesn't mean that we manage to uh, keep them, all of them, uh, all the time, but it's, it's the new uh, way of, uh, of life in, in, in business today, that we have to give them more challenges more frequently and try to um, make them really interested. The second thing is that they are very entrepreneurial. Um, and so how do you manage a company with 30, 3,200 people and a lot of them, 40% of them, being very entrepreneurial? So you need to uh, give them specific projects. Uh, you need to uh, give them the lead on specific initiatives. And I, I call them intrapreneurs. You know, I convert them into entrepreneurs within a bigger organization. Yeah, and I think that's... Um because probably the, the obvious follow-up to that is how do you keep millennials, right? Because there's so much job opportunity. If you're very connected online, you have so many offers, you have so many places you could go, you could start your own, you know, more All and right. more millennials starting I your own thing. I want to stop you there because I don't know. You know what, let's, let's just ask the audience. How many of you feel there are a lot of jobs out there and that you feel it's just a question of connecting with people and you'll get one? Okay, so uh, I mean I'm very <laughs> interested that you would think that because my, my reading of the job market is actually that people are very nervous there aren't jobs out there. Yeah. Um, well I think more and more, I think what we're getting to is that people don't necessarily choose a career for life, right? I mean that's, that's the change that's fundamentally happened is 
um, that, that whether there are right now in this current economy, you know, lots of jobs, um, the fact is that people don't have the expectation that they're going to be in the same career forever. I think that's right. the, more, the more general point. And I think, you know, from our perspective, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, maybe it's because I've run a company in, you know, a big city, and I think there are a lot of opportunities. Well, for and our, you're in a new industry. And we're in an industry which is media, which means that everyone in media is connected to everyone else. So you really need to provide something that's very, very compelling, that has a high level of autonomy, and I think you probably get the most out of millennials if you give them a lot of autonomy, if you give them projects that they own, that they feel like, you know, they take to completion. And, and that's a good, actually, part of the way that work has changed more recently is that people can own a full project. I think we've had this period where p everything got very conveyor belted. People didn't really understand how what they did contributed to a wider whole. And I think, you know, one way you can keep people motivated is to give them a full project that they own. Well, I, but I would say that was true over all generations. I mean, I have mainly millennials on my staff, mm -hmm. but I have quite a lot of Gen Xs. And I think the key to hiring and keeping good people is to assume they're competent and not to be in their face about things. Well, they're you wouldn't have hired them otherwise, hopefully. Right, but sometimes people don't end up delivering what they promise. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I'm interested in the idea of how new industries like tech set up, and maybe you could talk to this, how you actually set up, and hierarchy may not be the right word, because I know it's a sort of old, sort of white word in a way, but, but how, you, um, how you structure Mashable so mm -hmm. you feel you get the most out of people and hold on to the people that you respect and yeah, want. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, and it's always evolving and the tools are getting better and better. I think the key thing that we always want to do is, is figure out how do we, um, listen to the whole organization, but still have um, clarity on decision making and who owns the decision when it's made. So the way we work is we have team leads across about eight different departments who meet every week and say, here's what my department needs, here's what we want. And we figure out, okay, if we give your department this, where does it come out of? What has to suffer? Is everyone, you know, so we understand the effect on the whole organization whenever we meet, but it still is, um, you know, there still is a fact that, you know, decisions have to be made and we, we don't, you know, take a, we don't have a poll on Twitter every day where we say, hey, what are we going to do, you know? So, um, but there are companies that are trying that and we'll see, we'll see if that works out. I know that companies like Medium are trying more, which is uh, uh, Ebb's new thing. It's like trying to be more of a flat file, try and be completely flat across the organization. And if that stuff works, I think people will try it and be flexible to it. It's whatever's most efficient. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest challenge in a fast-moving economy. You need to, you can't wait for stuff to get all the way to the top and then all the way back down to move on something. You need to have, again, that level of autonomy where the people who make the product or the people who are on the ground have the autonomy to make a decision very, very quickly and move on it. It needs to be more of a network model, which is why the internet works so well, right? If, if your company can be a network model rather than having a singular node, which is a huge point of weakness if everything goes to a singular node, mm -hmm. um, you know, that person's off that day, your whole thing doesn't work. So you need a lot of connections between people and departments that are a lot more fluid than that. Yeah, I, I, if I may, I would, I would add something here. Uh, because the um, technology and the tools are, are evolving so fast, I keep telling my people they need to be, uh, we need to be a learning company, which means we need to try new things and you need to give that uh, power of decision to many people in the organization to try new things. And sometimes it, it will work, sometimes it won't work, and at times you can learn even more when it doesn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when it works, very often we don't we don't know why it worked, but mm. uh, and 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 we need to uh, share uh, uh, those lessons. Be very open, very transparent. We try that; it didn't work. This is why we think it didn't work, and uh, go on but learning. The, the thing that's changed a lot for us in recent years is data. It drives so many more decisions than people now, and so many more decisions than opinion. I think. Um, because it's very easy now to set up an experiment for something that everyone can agree. So you don't have to d agree on what the decision is, you just have to agree on what the experiment is that you're going to A-B test. And you know, when you have a site or when you have you know, a lot of social distribution as we do, we can test it out. We can say, you know, okay, is this headline better than this headline? Let's just run them both simultaneously and the one that outperforms will win. And you can do that in a more broad sense in, uh, as long as you're tracking the right metrics. So actually a lot of our decision making is 
got opinion taken out of it in terms of, you know, what content should we cover? Well, we'll test out this bucket of content, we'll test out this bucket, and we'll see what people are more receptive to. So that's really helped us a lot. It's much, much, much better than, uh, you know, if you give full autonomy to everyone and then they're not setting up good experiments, then you don't know whether their thing worked or not. It's more about teaching people to devise an experiment that would let you figure that out. Yeah, that's fascinating. I want to come back to a point you made about, uh, and this was actually reiterated in the Pew Research on Millennials, which came out on Friday, mm -hmm. which is that most Millennials, when they come out of college, um, want to be in a management position within two years. And it, it makes me think of a conversation I had with someone I had hired, and after two months she came to me and she said, I would like to talk to you about my career. <laughs> now, this was a girl who'd been on staff for two months. She was doing a perfectly good job. I had mm. great high hopes for her. And apart from wanting to just laugh, um, you know, I told her I uh, applauded her ambition, and the good news was she still had a job. Mm. And, and she looked, a couple of knowing laughs from some boomers down there, thank you. I do think, and you know, I, I have a millennial child. I'm constantly impressed by how much more educated, ambitious, um, connected uh, he is than I certainly am. But I'm also very aware of this sense of millennials being in a hurry, partly because the technology that they've grown up with has changed so fast, and them having a confusion that they sort of are the technology, and that actually there is great value to experience in the workplace, and there are all sorts of um, tools that you don't have when you're 24 and you've just come out of college, even if you've paid a lot of money and you've been to a great business school. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit to that. No, it is true that uh, uh, they are um, a bit impatient, but I think it's good if it is about learning more all the time. And one thing I've, I've learned myself is that if you have really talented people who uh, feel they get a bit bored in a job, they will leave anyway, okay? Right. So you have to be able, and it's, it's something the management uh, needs to understand and to be organized for, to, you need to be able to give new challenges on a very regular basis to those who uh, are successful, right? I mean. If, if someone asks for a new challenge and does it very well and delivers, then you have to uh, be able to give another challenge uh, as, as quickly as possible. But isn't that just good management? I mean, wouldn't mm. any manager, when you have someone who's really capable on your staff, they're stepping up, they're delivering, you give them more, don't you? I mean, well, why, why yeah, is that yeah, something well, that Well, I think the frequency and the speed of <laughs> is, is, yeah. Yeah, has changed. I mean, uh, I can compare with uh, how I, I work when, when I was a bit younger. And... Um, Managers didn't bother that much to yeah. give you new it, challenges it, 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 it that used frequently. You meet once a year and say, how are things going and is it time for promotion or whatever. And it does seem like right. it's more frequent now. There's sure. always an expectation at the year mark that you're going to have a discussion and there's going to be a discussion about you know, salary and position and that kind of thing and, how, and what the path is and how many years you know, have you got to go before you go to a certain point. So, uh, well, the sort of tyranny of the annual review, which, which seems crazy. But then in terms of, for example, salary, how do you organize salary at Mashable? Can people come in after they've been there three months and say, okay, I'm doing a great job, I'm really adding value, I want some more money? Or do you say, no. we'll review so, in a so year? So the way it works or? now is actually, so very early on as a startup, we didn't have levels. Now there are actually tiers that people can reach and there's certain, you know, so it's all agreed upon. So if someone comes in and says, you know, I think I should have a higher position, you can say, well, you know, we have this structure, a lot of people have been through it now, you have to get to this level before you can move to that level and you have to be able to do this. So there's, and I think that's actually respected quite a lot, that there is a qualifying thing that is even for everyone, because you don't want it to get political, like, well, why did this person get more? And then, because, you know, if you say yes to that person who comes to you after two months, then everyone else hears about that, right. and suddenly everyone comes to you after two months, and suddenly it's all managers, and you don't have anyone who isn't a manager anymore, and you have no one left to manage. I mean, so that can be, and it's certainly, you know, in early startups, certainly in our early years, over-promotion is a major thing that happens, because you don't have that many people, mm -hmm. and because you don't have that much money. And you can, um, you talk know, to, titles can become a way of keeping people on a track right. uh, without, you know, doing huge salary bumps. But now we have a structure that, um, 
the people have to achieve a certain level, in, and it varies based on their role. I mean, editorial is very different from sales. So you're becoming a normal company. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think, um, but I do think you can accelerate up that path at any speed. Yeah. There's no certain number of years, oh, yeah. right? So that's what's changed is. You don't have to stay at a company 10 years to get to the next level, of course. which is how it used to work, which is yeah. very, and again, data helps a lot there. It helps you see, well, you know, your performance is this. We have all this tracking of, of you know, on the editorial side especially, we can tell how many people are viewing your things, how engaging is it, is, are people positive or negative sentiment about what you're writing, which audiences are you, are you bringing in, and are you, you know, so you can do a lot more around, and, and I think a lot more decision making is just going to the data now. And, and, and just building on that, Joanna, if I may, I think you, you, were, you, were, you mentioned the annual review, and um, to me it's, it's dead, uh, because this generation, millennials love feedback. Mm. And it's probably the, the, the thing that they have uh, you know, experienced the most on uh, comments, and well, I no, like. And, uh, I think they like positive feedback. Yeah, I well, <laughs> usually um. people tend to prefer positive <laughs> feedback, but uh, I, I would say that um, we have to, I think we have to give to millennials m m feedback much more often than we used to. You're not going to wait for the annual review to give feedback on what they're doing, especially if they are, they are working on projects that are like three months or six months, you know. Uh, so I think this is a very important point in terms of management for um, the, the people in my organization. I, I keep saying, please give feedback, honest feedback, mm -hmm. uh, positive or constructive, because <laughs> if, if it's negative, it can be constructive. Yeah, uh, that's, that's code for negative. <laughs> I've got some constructive No, but you know, I mean, there are ways to do it. Yeah. Um, well, in and there, there are also ways to accept criticism, so you take criticism uh, seriously, but not personally, yeah. which I think is very But I think it is true that feedback now in organizations is universally constructive. It's very rare that you can actually get someone to do something by, first of all, starting by telling them that they're not doing a good job okay. and here's how you do right. better. So it's I challenging. Have, I have to tell you that. W w at one point, I worked at the Daily Telegraph very early on in my career, and I delivered my first story, and I was full of... I actually am an inner millennial, although technically I'm a Gen Xer, but as I was reading all the bad things about millennials, like we need feedback and we're narcissistic, I was like, I am a millennial mm -hmm. at heart. <laughs> anyway, I remember going in and, you know, I delivered my first piece. The news editor read it and he looked up at me and he literally said, this fucking sucks. <laughs> and I was like, oh. yeah, I had the same experience. <laughs> so you yeah. went with him too. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I scuttled back to my desk, kind of mortified. And then everybody said, oh, he says that to everybody. Actually, that means he quite likes it. And um, I, I, there was a sort of generation, certainly, of... Uh, I had a cartoonist, uh, a friend who was a cartoonist, and he delivered his, his first cartoon. And the same editor wrote, this is the world's worst cartoon, and pinned it on the wall. And there was a sort of humiliation that became a collective rite of passage, which, of course, one wouldn't want to revisit. And now it would be called a, abuse or, or yeah. sort of bullying. Um, but I, I'm, as a boss, I'm very mindful of uh, a younger generation needing a lot more support. But I think what's changed there is that there is much less gap between the person at the top and the... I mean, I think, and honestly, I think um, it, it, even though, you know, economically, I think there is a bigger and bigger divide, um, I think in, in modern companies like ours, there is also... Um, that the management, the so-called management, is less powerful in a sense. That it's that um, because everyone in your organization is connected. If there's a disconnect between the way you're leading mm. the organization and the way that they are reacting, that's going to come up. So it's sort of how social media has made everyone, it's democratized everything and given everyone a voice. I think in organizations, you know, we increasingly look at it like I don't look at it like management. It's like we build a platform, and our, in a way, our employees and our readers are all on the same platform, and we're kind of serving them as much as they're contributing back. I think it's that, that gap has gone away. And maybe, you know, economically, you know, we know the issues with that, that uh, there's a wider and wider gap, but I think cer certainly in newer organizations, there's actually more empowerment for the employee, and the employee has more of a voice, and, um, you know, they're out on Twitter and Facebook but, every uh, day if they I, don't. I, 
I have to say, I think that you, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure almost everybody in this room at this point wants to come and work for Mashable, and I know I do. I, th I hope what you're saying is true, but I fear for a lot of people in a lot of companies it's not true. It's and not I true yet, but here's the inevitability. that Social media makes everything more and more and more transparent. So it used to be that organizations could be immoral and then have a different PR campaign than what they were actually doing. Mm -hmm. And now both their customers and their staff are on social media. And you know you can guarantee that if someone quits, they'll, all your secrets will be out there. So you can't really have any secrets, which kind of means that you need to be good to everyone all the time. And I think as social media kind of goes through all different organizations and businesses, I think it's going to be harder and harder for uh, there to be a, a rift between layers of the company, the company needs to all be facing the same direction and doing also what it's saying. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's going to be harder for companies to do uh, that kind of thing. I mean, that would not happen. And I think, I think you're right to some extent. I mean, in many ways, it's a natural, it, it's, it is an inevitability. And in 2000, by the time 2025, 80% of the workforce will be millennials. I would also say it's dependent on the economy and the need that people have for jobs and to have a salary. And people know if you leave a company and go on Twitter and go mm. crazy about it, and I've mm. had this happen to me, other people will not hire mm. them. I mm. think it's not realistic to think that, um, that companies are that scared of that. Mm -hmm. and, and also now I think that the more people are on social media saying that stuff, the less relevant it becomes. When the first few people do it, it's really interesting. And then it becomes Well, I don't mean you have to go crazy. I just mean that in this world of transparency where everyone is connected, there is very little, that there is very little uh, opaqueness about organizations anymore. But uh, remember that uh, in, in traditional organizations in the 20th century before the web, uh, a lot of jobs... Um, a lot of people had jobs um, just because they had more information than other people. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So you had, yeah. you had all the hierarchy was almost made of uh, you know uh, proportional to the amount of information that you could have mm -hmm. uh, inside the organization. This is changing dramatically, of course, um, and and that's the first point. And I, I would agree that internally also we've become a lot more transparent. We're sharing a lot more. Almost, it's inevitable. Okay, so the hierarchy is flattening. The second thing is, we, we just uh, published a research on, on millennials, and millennials apparently want their boss to be a friend. Um, I on don't know Facebook whether or in real life. <laughs> yeah. Both, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's, it's, it's not the same Facebook thing. It's not the same thing. <laughs> but. Um, um, what I think, but what I'm asking the, the management to do is to change and to become a coach more than a, a boss that gives orders or instructions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that is also very important uh, for the uh, good, um, um, I would say. But how uh, do you separate that? I mean, that's very challenging if you're friends with uh, everyone that, that you work with. It's, it's, um, no, you, you shouldn't. Can't be friends with you, you can't be friends with everybody. My point is, but you, you can change the, your style it's, of management and become more it's of a, a coach yeah, you're than, a, than a, yeah. a, a boss yeah. that and they I think give that's, orders. That's what's changed. I think when you talk about the economy, it depends what industry. I mean, right. one thing that tech is changing, and it's the negative that, that people don't necessarily talk about, is the tech is um, making the world so efficient that it's getting rid of jobs faster than yes. it's creating them right now. Yeah. Um, so if you're super high tech and knowledgeable and are always on the cutting edge of these trends, you're fine. It's, it's the people who are in skilled jobs that are being replaced increasingly by technology that have to then retrain. And it takes a long time to retrain and become you know, a, a high technology worker. I think that's, that's where the challenges in the economy come. And that's where the challenges for millennials come. They have to be on the right side of that change when it happens. And it's happening faster than anyone can, can keep up with it. But now. there are also industries where experience matters. We were saying this beforehand mm -hmm. that I don't want to be operated on. If I have a cancerous tumor, I don't want a millennial doctor taking a selfie while he's pulling out or while she's <laughs> pulling out the tumor. I want someone who's done 300 of those operations. And this is their daily business. And similarly, if right. I'm on trial for murdering someone, I don't want, right. you know, a and there youthful are, there lawyer are, there are plenty who's of, seen stuff on CSI. There are plenty of industries where, although playing video games does actually make you a way better surgeon that was out uh, last week, that, that actually this, 
this generation is, has better hand-eye coordination, so things like your pilot or your surgeon might actually be better if they're a millennial and growing up in this world of constantly being exposed to things, reacting to things, developing hand-eye coordination. But I agree with you, stuff like being a pilot, you want to have X amount of hours, and you can't really skip that. Right. You, you just have to fly that. for that so, many hours. And I think that's what's really sort of crucial in terms of the millennial generation, that I remember, you know, constantly um, channeling my inner millennial when I started and being determined to go on bigger stories and being sent to countries that I didn't know anything about, where I didn't speak the language, whatever. And then you get there and you realize this is much harder than I thought it was. And actually mm -hmm. you do need the hours mm -hmm. because it gives you the confidence to do the right, to I do think the, the job best, well. The best organizations are going to figure out how to combine the experience of their uh, more senior employees with the kind of the, the ability to adapt very quickly in the zeal of new staff. Whenever we bring in like a raft of new staff, like we'll typically, you know, have a bunch of interns come in and then they all get upgraded to, um, you know, full-time positions, I think you can get a lot of energy in your organization, right? You can get a lot of new thinking and you can adapt very quickly. Um, so I think you just have to balance those two things. I think uh, for us, experience is incredibly valuable and we have a number of experienced people that we've brought on over the previous uh, year or so. Um, mainly we've done it later on because it is more expensive to hire for experience. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's incredibly powerful. And if you can combine those two things, that's the ultimate, I think. You, you don't want to be either or. OK, so we've got, if you want to ask questions, by the way, we don't have a facility for asking them live, but you can tweet them, hashtag ask why. And they're now going to come up on our monitor. And I'm going to go to one. But just before we do, I have a question for both of you. Um, when I, I became editor of Cosmo 18 months ago, and when I got there, none of the staff were on Twitter or, or Facebook, and I couldn't understand why. And there had been a sort of edict under the previous regime that mm. this was not something they could do. And I was like, well, you all have to be on Twitter, you all have to be on Facebook, and that's the whole point. You know, get out there and have lives and be tweeting about it and everything. And it's something that, you know, and I'm assuming that they're not going to tweet anything so ridiculous that it, it puts us all um, in danger. But as a boss, I'm comfortable with taking that risk. But I know you recently have, and I don't see it as a risk. I mean, I see it as a conversation. I want them busy on social media, and I'm happy for them to do it on work time when necessary, because I think it's good for all of us, and it's good for the brand. But I know you, we were talking before that you just had an incident where a client felt uncomfortable about a tweet. Yes, I mean, but we do encourage everybody to use all the social media they can use, and then it's a, it's, it's a matter of responsibility, and that's where there can be some learning from uh, more experienced people on uh, situations, uh, judgment. You know, judgment is not something you, you learn easily, mm -hmm. uh, contrary to what uh, um, some uh, think. And, and so, it's an education process, but you have to realize that everything you put online will stay online, will never disappear, uh, and will uh, be seen by even people you don't, you don't know, as we've learned recently on a massive scale. That's so why millennials use Snapchat. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, do you encourage them to use Snapchat? Um, all right, let's ask our first question. Uh, and I have got a new contact lens prescription, and I'm now <laughs> discovering it doesn't work as well as I thought it did. I can see it. Um, good. Could you read it out, actually? I can this see it with my glasses. Millennial eyesight. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you read uh, it out, Pete? Is there hope to... This is Hannah Arnold, I Hannah think? Hannah Arnold. Uh, is there hope to help bridge the gap between people who choose a career for life and Gen Y? Hashtag Ask Y. Hashtag South by Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> So is there hope for people who choose a career for life and Gen Y who presumably don't want a career for life? Um, I think it's very challenging to actually have a career for life uh, now. I think anyone who starts a job now and thinks that in 40, 50 years that's going to still be a thing that that... There's no company really that you could bet on right now, or very few that you could say, that company is absolutely going to be fine for the next 40 years and nothing's going to disrupt their industry at all. I mean, it used to be that a really, like being at an established company was very safe. If a company's been around for 100 years, 200 years, they know what they're doing, their experience is so great, they're doing it better than anyone. 
well, it's a whole new world in digital communication, digital distribution, uh, anything from commerce to, as we're seeing in media, to um, virtually every, it's very hard to think of industries. I mean, you know, banking and finance was largely protected. It's now so starting to be transformed. It took a longer time because there's more regulation, but it's very, very hard to think of any career that you could start right now at one company and know you're going to finish it at the same company. Um, so I don't even know if you can bet on that anymore. Everyone has to be flexible now. And also, I feel that if, if that was your dream, it would be... It would be a lame dream. Yeah, it would be really <laughs> lame. It would be really lame. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you're talking about companies. Uh, maybe if you want to be a doctor, if you want to right. be a surgeon, right. if you want to be a professor, think, you can be a professor actually, all your life long. I actually yeah. think right. staying in the same career, it comes back to that experience thing. If you can find what you want to do early on, um, and you do find what you enjoy, you will, the amount of hours you put in is the main determinant. I mean, talent is a very small piece of it. Experience is the vast majority in practice. So um, if you can find what you love to do, staying in that career for your whole life will make you the best at that. It's very hard to come in later on. There is a built-in advantage to the people who've been doing it for 10 or 20 years. Uh, you can certainly do it, and I think people, if they don't like what they're doing, should absolutely switch careers to something they enjoy doing. That's the, that's the joy of modern life, that you can find something you enjoy and stick with it. But certainly, the longer you do something, the better you get at it. It doesn't matter who you are. All right, so we have another question now, which is sort of on the same theme, actually, from Matthew Kapala, which is, is job security dead in corporate America? I don't know whether it ever existed, <laughs> mm. but... Uh, uh, I think that uh, you know mi millennials want to want to learn and to have um, a different experience. I think it's very natural and very good at the beginning, at least, to be able to have two or three very different experiences. And then, as you said, and my advice has always been: find a place where you can be really passionate about what you are doing. If you get bored, please move on, uh, because you you're not going to be very really good at what you're doing. So. If you can be passionate for a long time, on uh, you know, fine. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's very but, difficult. But yeah, it's, I know people use you know words like that. I know as journalists, we love saying stuff's dead. It's so, it's so satisfying. It's never quite true, but it's almost there. I think um, I think there is very little job security anymore. I think it's and it's not it's not power. The, I think. Being loyal to a company, the company appreciates that. It's just that the companies themselves aren't even in control of the economic factors that are changing themselves. So I think it's not even that, you know, I think sometimes people look at it like, you know, corporations, no, not only do employees no longer have loyalty to corporations, but the corporations no longer have loyalty to the employees. I think what's really happening is the economics are moving so fast that it's kind of messing up everyone and that the companies can't move fast enough to support the economics and they get caught out. So. Well, and I think people are encouraged to think of themselves as their own brand, so they're able to switch careers. And once you've built a social media profile, then in a sense, that is who you want to be. Mm -hmm. And you're looking for things where that will fit. Mm -hmm. So people feel less allied to, to specific companies or industries. Yeah, the personal brand. Yeah, I think that's been a big part of um, people being able to transition between jobs. There is a permanent profile. Um, that's always updating about what you're doing and your your portfolio is out there for everyone to see of, of what you've been doing for the last few years. So I think the, the growth of personal brands has been actually very, very great for people looking to, you know, move up in their career. I, I, I noticed that millennials are quite uh, demanding um, and I think we've switched from a time when companies were choosing you, were recruiting you, to a time when um, especially for the most talented millennials, they choose the company they want to work for. That's interesting. Yeah. They, we've got one up that's kind of interesting. Our titles, this is, is it Christine relevant. or Christina? Christine, Christine Church. Church. Uh, are titles relevant when a startup has a 25-year-old senior director? Will that translate to other companies? Hashtag ask why. <laughs> um, that's a good question, actually. I think... Um, so I think titles are relevant. I think it comes back to that idea of it translates in industries where the amount of time you've been doing it does not directly correlate to how well you do it, um, which I think in media it's probably 
um, or in any industry that's being changed very, very quickly, it's possible to accelerate much faster because the knowledge decays so quickly. I mean, technology, it's every six months there's practically a refresh, and someone who's joined a couple years ago, they don't have as much experience, but certainly they're more on trend. I mean, the people that we hire that are, that are new out of school, they're Snapchatting. They're, um, you know, they're using all the new cutting edge tools, whereas we're sitting on Twitter like old people, you know? So, um, old people aren't on Twitter. <laughs> I've tried to help some people at my company go on Twitter who are older than I am. And they're not, they're, even they are not on Twitter. Yeah. So I think um, titles are relevant. I think it only translates in industries where, uh, where you can accelerate very quickly. And I think, as we've said, there are some industries where it's just about the number of hours and you get better with more hours. And in that case, you can't have a 25-year-old senior director of a company that is not being transformed rapidly. I find titles really annoying. If I could get rid of all titles, I would. We have a masthead in the magazine, so unusually for a company, it's very public. And pe I find people spend a huge amount mm -hmm. of energy worrying about their title. Where does the word mm. associate go? I think, go I think titles are not... So I, you know, I often react like this, um, where I'm just, I don't know, what, what title do they want? You know, it's like, it doesn't... But I think what we don't realize is that externally, right. it has a big... If you email someone and you have a title that sounds big, you're more likely to get a response. I mean, that's as long as you don't become like, you know, I think we had this trend when I was when I was starting out where everyone was a ninja. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if ninjas got their emails answered as much as directors did. But I do feel everyone in corporate America is a vice president. And you think of it's the least important job in the sense of vice president. And um, I do think that in particular in corporate America, it's an obsession. I mean, it's less of an obsession in Europe, actually, I think. But, I mean, you made the point earlier that you give people titles. You know where it does transfer, and it's very powerful for transference, is if you then go to another company. When, as you know, you can't hire people that really, if you're trying to, you know, uh, get someone to move jobs and they're quite happy in their current job, you can't hire them at a title lower than their current title. <laughs> so if title inflation starts happening across the industry, what happens is that, you know, you see someone at, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and this happens when bigger companies hire from a startup, say someone has a VP position, there's only five people, they end up with a VP at a much bigger mm -hmm. company. So uh, in that sense, they do translate because when, people get hired by other companies, they have to give them the same level title. But you know, when I, I recruit people, uh, I, I, I barely look at the titles. I, I really ask people, what were you doing? What is this mm. position mm. really? Uh, how important is it in your organization? And I think internally, with people we hire, we should be uh, more focused on what we expect from them in a given but, but role you, than uh, uh, the, the title itself. And there's such an inflation of titles. Yeah, you just have to be very careful. Well, title inflation doesn't actually benefit anyone no. because in the, it comes back to that same sense. If you overinflate titles, and that's why now we have this you know, track, then you end up with a situation where you can't put people above those people because there's nothing left above. Um, so once you start becoming a bigger organization and you need, you know, very senior people to come in, you've got nowhere to put them in the deck. And then, you know, in the same way, new people that, that, uh, that join kind of see that and say, oh, I can become, you know, a VP within a month or whatever. You know, you really but need look, to be very careful. For instance, uh, you see chief talent officer. As, as, as a, someone in charge of a company, mm. I, I feel like I am a chief mm. talent officer. Mm -hmm. right. and, and, you know, yeah, but I mean, so the, the, there are different uh, titles being used that uh, don't necessarily describe very well. I think it is extremely important as we were talking about feedback. It's very important to define what we expect from someone mm. in the next six months or in the next 12 months mm -hmm. and then give that uh, feedback on a very regular basis. And so we have another question. What are some tips for managing millennials who want to run before they can walk? So, Olivier, I mean, you were half answering that in your last answer with saying they need feedback, clear goals, clarity. What else? Uh, well, I think they, you, you can tell them that they can learn a lot from uh, previous generations, not on technology, not on how to use social tools, but. Uh, on uh, different aspects of what experience brings to you, connections you have, uh, people you know outside, the way you, you uh, deal with um, partners and clients and, uh, and all this 
requires some experience, and they should uh, they should certainly uh, learn about that. I, I would also say, please travel and and uh, don't hesitate to uh, take a job in in a foreign country, uh, because we want to be uh, more and more. The web is a global mm -hmm. world. Uh, there are no boundaries, and it, 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 believe me, I've I've bought companies in China, in India, in Brazil. There's still a lot we, we should be learning if you want to be a, 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 a manager right. about other cultures. So I would, I would say before you run, uh, you know, you, you should learn a bit more uh, about it, it. In the Pew Research on Friday, it said that it was only 20% of millennials who felt it was important if they were offered a foreign assignment to take it. That, that millennials actually less than um, Gen Xers and less than the boomers were interested in taking you know, even a two-year secondment to another country, which I was surprised hmm. about. But, but you're in a fascinating position. You started your own company. It's grown like wildfire. Mm -hmm. It's doing brilliantly well. And yet you have had to morph from, from uh, sort of a small company to suddenly employing many more people mm -hmm. and being the mm -hmm. boss when you are younger than mm -hmm. some of the senior people mm -hmm. you've hired. Tell us about your own management techniques? I think that comes down to autonomy. I mean, again, the way, the way it works is that um, there's a group of essentially eight people who meet every week and synthesize all the knowledge from the entire organization and say, well, you know, we kind of need more of this and people are saying they want this. And then we look at, well, how does that weigh up against this other department because you have a certain amount of money and a certain amount of time. And that's really what decision making is. It's about resource allocation, who gets what and what does it cost and can we all agree on something that, you know, we're not going to do something if it's at a massive cost to another important piece of the organization. And we look back at our chart and say, OK, what are the three things we want to achieve this year? Does this help us achieve them? And if not, you know, we're not going to do it. I think um, so what I do is, you know, again, when we have, when we have you know, a very uh, experienced person in charge of our editorial, he has complete control of editorial. The only points of interaction are, are the resources that you need. So budgeting, for instance, is something we'll all meet on and say, OK, if you get more budget, it has to come out of here. Um, but high level of autonomy. I virtually, you know, virtually all the decision making happens at that level of the organization. And have you had to pull back from some of the people that you started with or that you hired in your initial hirings because you were more, um, well, you were closer with them, and then as the company grew and your responsibilities grew, you had to sort of pull back a bit, or? You mean in terms of like, being, are we talking about being friends with your, your staff, or is that, is that what you get? Well, you mean in terms point, of? I mean, the interesting thing is, as you, as you in said, In terms of know, how many people have a direct line yeah, to you? Yeah, it's not a democracy. Running a business is not yeah, a democracy. Yeah, that's, and that's, a that's the biggest challenge of scale, is that you, know, you don't get to, it's fun when you start out that you get to interact with everyone on a daily basis, and you don't when you hit, I don't know what the, like 100 plus, you just, you, know, you just can't do it, especially when you have a lot of remote locations. Um, but again, I think it's about making sure that even if you can't be there, um, you know, on the ground for absolutely everyone, that you have the feelers built. You know, you have the system that each team is small enough. They feel like they have a high level of autonomy and accountability, and they feel like I think that's where a lot of the gaps can come is when people feel like there's a rift between what they want to do and the broader company's goals, and that they're not synced with them. So, um, is you know, your I door think that's always open as a boss? I mean, do you, do you work in an office? Do you work in a in a hub, what's your physical sure. office? Yeah, I have an actual, like with walls and all that, like very traditional, you know? Right. <laughs> um, that's, that's unusual now, that's unusual. Uh, it is, I th well we have a fairly open plan office, but we do, um, we do have individual offices as well. It's pretty important from, it's funny because you know, we just, we're just moving offices in the summer and we just you know, had to build out a whole new space. And it's, it's funny the way that millennials work is people think that they want a big open plan space where they all work together. And we surveyed our staff and that it wasn't what they wanted at all. Um, that they want a balance between that open collaborative space mm -hmm. and being a, able to go away and focus, especially because you know, we have a lot of writers on our team and they can't have a salesperson next to them on the phone. They can't have you know, other writers all around them on the phone making a lot of noise, distracting them. Um, you know, when people come into our office, they say it's so incredibly quiet. You know, you have this big open plan area of the editorial. Everyone's got their headphones in and is typing away. And I think, you know, I was kind of it kind of opened my eyes a little bit on that when we designed our new space. That people wanted that balance. They wanted 50%, you know, 
open working spaces, 50%, the ability to go away, have a lot of offices that are flexible that people can go into, make a phone call, work on something heads down, come back out. So, uh, you know, I find that was really compelling. So that is changing, I think. You know, when we, when we built out our new space, it is, though, all glass, right? It's that you want to, you know, one of our biggest frustrations with our current space is you want to be able to see everyone. You want to be able to know, oh, I can bump into that person or, okay, I'll see that person um, later on. But if you can't see everyone else in the space, I think that's the challenge. But sound-wise, you want to have... Privacy. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's an yeah. interesting balance. It's, uh, and, I you was know, surprised when that people didn't want to just work in a big collaborative space. When, yeah. when you are going to grow, and that's what we wish for you, you know, mm. to grow even yeah. bigger, then uh, nobody can be in, in the same room. Uh, uh, not everybody can be in the same room. So uh, if I'm working for you, and I'm, say, you know, not working directly, but I want your attention, can I just come and see you at any time? Do you have a door that's physically open? Yes. Right. And I try to, uh, um, and you can send me an email, or you can. Uh, um, I'm not using um, um, uh, WeChat or WhatsApp yet. Uh, WhatsApp, maybe. you can WhatsApp me. <laughs> Snapchat, or Snapchat. 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 Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'm, <laughs> I'm using Twitter, and uh, and actually uh, I interact uh, through uh, to LinkedIn, Twitter, and and uh, traditional emails uh, with a lot of people in the organization. It's. I, I feel so like you're both our accessible is the point. Yeah, but I feel like our structure is a lot more. People wouldn't have to ask me to do things. They wouldn't have to get. There are very few things that I would have to approve for them to get done. I mean, it, it would have to go all the way up to the budgeting level, right? That's really where the decisions are made, and we do our budget. We do our yearly budget, and then we revise it. So, basically, after that's done, people go into their groups, do their projects, and know how much know what they've got to achieve, know how much money they have to achieve it, and at that point, it's completely distributed. And, you know, a lot of the time people are, you see this in new office spaces, there'll be people working from home on certain days, we've got a West Coast office, there'll be people covering, you know, something in Barcelona, or some, you know, right now, big groups in South by Southwest. So, you know, I think people are more comfortable as well bringing stuff to you online. I'd say more often than not. Actually, then that's an interesting thing about this generation, more comfortable probably emailing you about something than, knocking on the door. That's a big, when someone knocks on the door, it's like, oh, there's something up. You know, like the, by the time it's got to that level, um, you know, if someone's, yeah, I think, I think actually they, it's on a lower level. It's more, it's well, more though, mm -hmm. email or, or do it digitally than, uh, than knock on the door. All right, that, that, the, the, your point about working from home leads very nicely into this question, which is from, I'm gonna need you to read the name out. Lucy, Lucy Zarlengo Moran. How are millennials changing the notion of work-life balance, Olivier? Well, I think they, um, it's a question that uh, we, we discuss very often, especially with people working in many different countries uh, across uh, all regions who can't be together anyway. How much time can people, do people really need in physical interaction? to work well together. How many times do we need to bring them? By the way, we brought all our digital and social team here to mm. South by Southwest from China, from Brazil, from everywhere. And it's a great experience. Um, but I think more and more, when I see how I work, and I travel a lot, mm. I can work, and I have to work from anywhere, mm. <laughs> basically. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think the dream of, uh, the dream of um, the new millennium was pretty much the people would work less and there'd be more leisure time. I think what's actually happened is the two have just merged. You know, and I'm fine if someone wants to, well, obviously our staff have to be on Facebook, but if someone needs to, you know, Monday lunchtime, you know, they need to order their groceries or whatever, or whatever they, you know, there's a balance point because you know that once they go home, there is no real going home from work anymore. It's, they're still going to be checking their email. They're still going to be, you know, on their social media. They're still going to be, doing, um, they shouldn't be accessible. So I think as companies have come to ask more and more of people that there's almost a demand that you're accessible at all times and not just in any specific workplace, but in all workplaces, I think then that has to become the case that companies are more flexible with what people can do with their at work time that they can, that they can maybe move some of their personal time, you know, I mean, t t typically, uh, millennials ha are changing the way uh, the, the, the work-life balance, and, and but they I, are. I also think that more, um, and maybe it's very utopian, um, 
is South by Southwest work or life? Is it fun or is it work or is it both? You know, both. I think so. And I think more and more things are both. And I think more and more people's personal networks intersect with their work networks. And, you know, I think maybe even in the previous, maybe it's just, I remember my dad's generation was like, you had your work colleagues and you had your friends and never the two shall meet. And I think more and more it's just merged. I have a sense also that that question might have been referring to women in the workplace and whether or not you have children. And my feeling mm. is, uh, and I feel it's very important and this doesn't get talked mm. about very much, that there is very little balance and balance mm. might not be the thing that we should be searching for and that there is a glory in the chaos of it all and that there will be moments when there is no balance at work and you're giving yourself a hundred percent and this thing has to work and there will be moments if your child is ill or sick or needs you at the school play that it's about a hundred percent I think home. it needs to become culturally acceptable to be off the grid and I think that has I think what's happened is things have got faster and faster. it began with the Blackberry era remember pre Blackberry people weren't always accessible but then when everyone knew you had a phone in your pocket at all times they also could kind of abuse that privilege and just email you at any time I think companies do need to take pride in weekends and in taking time off and encouraging you people your, to take vacations. Do, do you contact your staff at the weekends? No. Right. Do you um, do I? contact your staff at the weekends? Do it ha it happens. I, I, must, I, mean, I, think what, what I must be very <laughs> frank, it happens. I think, I think what actually, sometimes at weekends we'll be reading, you know, a lot of the time, especially the, the more senior team, we'll catch up on our reading and we'll be emailing articles back and forth and saying, hey, I missed this this week, did you see this? But it's not anything with an expectation of a reply, it's more casual right. of trying to figure I out what are we going to do next week and how are we going to react and go forward. But uh, it's gotten, but, I, no, but being transparent, when we were a much smaller organization, we absolutely did not take weekends off. It's only, that's a wonderful privilege of once you get, have enough people to cover the weekend. I used to work all weekend and everyone would work all weekend because we didn't have enough people not to work the weekend. So um, I wouldn't recommend it because you really get no time to reflect and get better at what you're doing and kind of recharge and think about being strategic about what you're doing, you're just doing what you're doing the whole time. But um, And also I think when you're, often when you're a millennial, if you're starting off in work and you're loving what you're doing, yeah. it's no sacrifice working through the weekend. I mean, we have people that stay mm. in the office late at night because they love what they're doing some yeah. of the time. Yeah, um, and I think in creative industries especially, if being creative is what you like yeah. to do, then, you know, if you get to write or um, produce or whatever you're doing, you want to do it whenever you can. You don't really see it as a cost. It's not that work is something, work isn't something that you uh, have to do. It shouldn't be always a cost. I think a lot of, in the past, it's been seen as work is something that you don't want to do and life is something that you do want to do. But I think on, you know, the, um, the gender issue, I think there does need to be a cultural shift because as we've built this expectation that people are online all the time and that they're always connected and always accessible, uh, it's driving people to work actually more and more and more and to cut into personal time and to cut into family life. And I think uh, that does need to evolve and there needs to be, a, it's all culture. It's not even, the technology is not in charge of us. It's, we're in charge of us. And I think it's really about our concerns about the expectations of other people. What will they think if I don't work weekends? Right. Whereas if nobody works weekends, that becomes culturally acceptable. Well, and also, uh, and actually, I think this is one of the things that millennials are brilliant about. And I've learned from watching them in my uh, office is saying no occasionally, just saying, you know what, I'd love to do that, but I can't do it this weekend. And then mm. me thinking, okay, fine. They mm. put their foot down and that's great. And I've been able to do that too. Um, did you have anything to add to that point? Well, I think um, um, c the culture of a company comes from the top. And, and so it's for the top management to, to uh, explain, you know, how they want people to, to work and whether there should be a, a real difference between your time at home and your time in the office, and there should be. Uh, but the technology is, 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 is putting a lot of pressure on everybody because people, when they send uh, any message, uh, expect a, a quick response. Yeah. And, and Turn so, off red receipts, that's yeah. the trick. On your texts, you, yeah. don't want it, you don't want them to go, oh, it's read it. So and that, but that is the expectation now, is that yeah. Yeah, as soon as you send something, especially now if you can see that they've read it, it's, um, is so we have to set the rules. Response. We have to but set the rules. But I think there's also got to be levels of which form of communication you use, and that's really just an etiquette thing. For if you want an answer right now, if you want an answer later, millennials don't call each other. That if someone calls me, that's right. a strange thing. 
Yeah. It's like, that's oh. like immediate urgent, something is going wrong. Then right. there's the text, then there's the email, then there's like, it well, goes down. There's all, all points of communication, yeah. basically. You know they're trying to get hold of you. All right, so we have one and a half minutes left. We have one, one let's take this last question because it's a good one. It's from Hair Castile, and it's how do you recommend millennials better engage with co-workers from older generations? Olivier? Mutual respect. That's what I'm trying to build in, in my organization. Uh, there's a reverse sort of mentoring process that we can have with millennials, but they can learn a lot also from previous generations. It's about respect and learning mm -hmm. from others. And not feeling and threatened. I actually, yeah. actually do think millennials have a lot of, from what I've seen at our organization, have a lot of respect for experience. And because they're so keen to advance their careers and they're so ambitious that they do see in um, people with more experience the opportunity to learn and progress. And I think that drive actually probably does lead them to ask a lot of questions and be very inquisitive. And I think actually that's a very, a very good thing. And, and we haven't seen, and maybe it's unusual, any kind of divisiveness or ability to not communicate on the same page. I think the biggest challenge we have at our organization, because it moves so fast, um, is adapting to new stuff really fast. I mean, we even feel like, you know, I'm 28. I feel like the 18-year-olds are in a whole different category now. It's not even, you know, millennial is such a big bucket, but there's almost a split now between the people who grew up with mobile apps, grew up with iPhones, grew up with smartphones, grew up with that ability, and the people who, you know, didn't, you know, tweet and Facebook from, from day one at school, so. All right, and I think the secret is having everybody working together. It's great having that mix of generations. Um, but listen, we've come to the end. Honestly, this is one of the most fun panels I have done. I feel like we've had really good interaction Thank between you, our Joanna. panelists. I feel like they haven't always agreed, <laughs> and that is a rare thing. And I'm very excited that we had a chance to explore this over an hour because I found it helpful, useful, and I really hope you did. So Pete Cashmore and Olivia Fleurot, thank you Thanks very much. Thanks for having much. me. <laughs> thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Well done. <laughs>